I don't think there is much clarity around Aotearoa as to where the issues are with the white ferns. A lot of people are just looking at the players, um, but there are some key things that to me, as uh, like some things along with what you've said that outline, that help us learn where the issue is. Three captains and two players taking a well-being break is the major thing. That simply, like, yes, of course, as you, as you explained, there are nuances here, there are situations, but that is not, a re again, conducive to winning. Three captains and two different well-being breaks is not conducive to winning, and that reflects poorly on the coaching and the structure around the team. Because if everything is honkadori, if everything's roses, if everything is a great team culture, great connection with the coach and the support staff and New Zealand cricket, three, three different captains and two different well-being breaks doesn't happen. Like, so that seems like a bit of an issue. Players who were responsible for winning a lot of cricket, then losing a lot of cricket, doesn't seem dependent on the players, which is that there is a large sample size of a losing record under Bob Carter. So excuse me for thinking that Bob Carter is responsible for that, right? Like I'm going to side with the players, not Bob Carter. So here we've got three different things. We've got three captains. We've got two different well-being breaks. We've got a comprehensive losing record. That for me, that is three reasons to side with the playing group. In all their wisdom, selectors chose to ignore Kate Ibrahim and to ignore Lee Kasparik. I said prior to the World Cup, Lee Kasparik was, OD, was Aotearoa's best ODI bowler ahead of the World Cup. The best. So if you don't select Lee Kasparik, I'm siding with the players. <laughs> and if you consistently ignore Kate Ibrahim, one of the best ODI batters, or best one-day batters in Aotearoa, okay, that's another thing. So that's the fourth thing, which pushes me siding with the playing group as opposed to siding with the coaches, selectors, and New Zealand cricket. That's four clear things to skew me towards favoring the playing group. Someone had to, someone made the decision to play Fran, Fran Jonas ahead of Francis Mackay in the first game. Someone made that decision. Don't think it was Francis Mackay. Don't think it was Fran Jonas. And based on my um, perception outlined here, I don't think it was Sophie Devine either as captain. I think it was the coaches and selectors, um, whoever you know, wants to take responsibility, you can. Um, but someone decided to play Fran Jonas ahead of Francis Mackay for the first game, which the West Indies won. Okay, so that's another dubious decision which pushes me in favor of the playing group. Let alone the development contracts and the talent identification. Players have nothing to do with that. None of these players are deciding which players get development contracts. And I am firm in my belief that the players have very limited say in how various squads are selected. So, again, the losing record, we've got a comprehensive sample size. We've got two years of development contracts. We've got three to four years of squads being selected. Players in this World Cup squad and a traveling reserve were selected for the squad having played less than 20 or 30 one-day games of domestic cricket. That's not the players' fault. <laughs> That's selection issues, let alone how Francis Mackay is is deployed in a game or 
Frances Mackay wasn't even like a factor in the White Ferns ODI squad 12 months ago. She wasn't even a factor in the first 11 for the first game of the World Cup. That's not the player's fault. That's planning. That's preparation. That's coaching. That's selection, let alone executing skills in key moments and how the players, did the players improve? That's coaching. That's some of the stuff. Like if you're uh, good coaching, develops skills, develops confidence, develops talent to perform in the key moments. As you've said, none of that really happened. So I don't know, like some of that stuff you could like, like for the purpose of this exercise, some of that stuff you could come back to me and play devil's advocate with your little nuance and your little little context that you love to dish out, right? Like, but I, I'm confident that I've got three to four key things there that are the responsibility of coaches and selectors and the governing body overseeing that. Those things are the reason why the White Ferns underperformed at this World Cup. So those things tell us the players, uh, you know, they, they have to accept some responsibility for their individual performances. But our observations, I believe, make it clear that the White Ferns issues were with coaching, were with selection, we're with the culture around the White Ferns and the, the opposite of like the yogurt city kickboxing kefir culture stuff that I was thinking about a year or two ago. Like that stuff was, uh, they developed it over a long period of time. It festered and it grew and then it grew out and all the different factors. There was a toxic bit of yogurt somewhere in that white ferns setup and that was i um, my argument here is that that was developed by the coaches selections and weird decisions by the people tasked with making the decisions not the people tasked with playing cricket and that's why the white ferns are out of this world cup ahead of the semi-finals and yes the White Ferns lack the things that other nations have. But Aotearoa is the best sporting nation in the world because teams like the White Ferns have achieved at the highest level regardless of that resource. So that's just an excuse. That's just the, like, that's just pure laziness. That's for people who don't understand everything else. Like, that's for people who believe it was all good to not select Lee Kasprick straight up. So the um, the the yogurt container just wasn't airtight. Lid, lid wasn't on properly. Some something got contaminated in there or something, and the you know the wrong kind of mold starts growing. And well, see, see, bit... well, could I put a bit of lime juice in my water for a couple of reasons? I've done that before, yeah. But you can't do that with a plastic the, bottle. The first one. But you can only you do can't? that with a glass bottle because when you do it with a plastic bottle and you have your Limeinated water sitting around for a couple of hours, get a bit of get a bit of mold, get a bit of ickiness loitering in your plastic bottle. Obviously, I've experienced this, right? Like that is the white ferns. It's like, okay, you've got if you've got a glass bottle, it's all good. There's no issue. The white yeah, ferns didn't they have could a be glass nicely bottle. sterilized. Yeah, the white ferns, no issues with the glass bottle. They didn't have a glass bottle, in fact. The white ferns had a plastic bottle. They had beautiful, you know, uh, mountain water from the Southern Alps. They had organic limes from the back blocks of Aotearoa. But, well, this is it. The players are the water. The players are the organic lime. Like the... The buzz and excitement of women's cricket is what limonated water is. But it's in a plastic bottle. And you can't drink that water if it's in a fucking plastic bottle, you feel me? And if it's in a plastic bottle, it's because New Zealand cricket put it in a plastic bottle because they were like, oh, that's good enough. You know, it's, we don't need to 
We don't just splash out on a glass one. That's expensive. But what if we drop it? It might break and shatter, and then we'll have to pick up glass shards from all over the place. And we'll just use this plastic one. We'll just use this recycled pump bottle. Don't put it through the dishwasher. It's fine. It's, it's, it'll, be, it'll be all right. It's good enough. Um, it's good. It's good enough for the white ferns. But obviously, if you want to treat your top women's um, cricket team as one of the best nation, like one of the best um, national teams on the planet. It's, plastic isn't good enough, is it? And it's clear, like you hiring inexperienced or unproven coaches to give them, like whether they're good or not. Like they haven't proven they can do this yet, and going straight into a job like that is massive. And it's maybe not the, it's, you know, maybe not the best example either. If but one, I mean, I, I want to be careful with how I say this because it, there's nothing that says like having a couple forty year old guys and a sixty year old guy coaching a women's sports team can't be successful there's plenty of examples of them being super successful with that kind of thing like um but i mean the two like mental health breaks does play into something like because you do have to be careful because none of them played international women's cricket you know and there are differences and there are like there's tactical differences and then there's just like you know player differences um and i I, I do think you've got to be careful if you're going to go with an all male coaching staff for for something like that. I think that's a risky move, um, and it's not it's not like a. Um, uh, I could imagine the radio sport talk back um, callers going off at that about like uh, you know, twenty twenties wokeness and stuff like it's ridiculous words like that. But it, it's just common sense to have like coaches who can um get the best out of your player because i i hear this all the time when people say things about like oh, you know brian clough back in the day when he was coaching um uh, you know in the 60s in the english club football he, he wouldn't he wouldn't take no shit from any of these modern players with their you know um, driving around in their ferraris yeah but if the modern players are driving around in ferraris then you need to like you need to adjust you can't treat them like you would have in the 60s right you got to you got to work with what you got um and it's there's it's nothing to do with judgments whatsoever it's who can get the best out of the players and obviously bob carter couldn't get the best out of the players that he was working with um we know the players are good enough because if you're losing three very close games against semi-final caliber teams then obviously you're good enough to have won those games like you're in the point at which it becomes a, a close could go either way battle then it could have as easily gone your way if you just own a couple of those big moments that the coach is there to help prepare you for um tactically and mentally and yeah, you know, needless to say about the the batting orders, <laughs> like just just chuck that one out there. We know the top four is settled. Everything after that, it felt like you could just pick a pick a straw um, as to who's going to come in at five through eleven. Is it, it was all over the show, and the players they would send in where it feels like, or maybe they're just chucking in pinch hitters or something like that. First of all, like it, it almost never worked. Um, so maybe <laughs> just the an idea in the first place, and just make through make sure you get through your overs, but. That like one of their best pinch hitters ought to probably be Jess Kerr on form based on what she was doing in Super Smash, but that's not how she's been 11 most games at this World Cup. And then, you know, Frankie McKay could bat anywhere from five through to 10 or 11, like all over the show. Um, I don't know that that really helps batters. When you talk about a team that didn't bat out their overs often enough, right? That's one of the main things that's been thrown at them. Um, that they lost too many late wickets, that they couldn't get those late partnerships and get the most, like, like ring those last runs out of, um, which are super crucial and for some of the close games that they lost. Maybe players not knowing what scenario or what situation they're going to come into bat is not the best way to prepare them for that kind of thing. Like, if, if you don't know if you're going to be coming in at 5 or 11, depending on whatever the game looks like, maybe... Maybe that's why players are coming in and losing quick wickets and not being able to put together those partnerships in the last 10 overs. Like maybe that's, maybe those are related ideas, you know? I saw in the, these weren't the like, uh, um, these were ahead of the last few games, I think, but there was a graphic in which the White Ferns, oh yeah, this was prior to um, the White Ferns beating Pakistan. It was like midway during the game. And they put up a graphic and the White Ferns, were like second to last or last in having the highest death bowling RPO. And then I saw yesterday the White Ferns were second to last or even last in scoring runs in the final 10 overs. 
So they were among the worst teams at this World Cup for death bowling and death batting. That is not players. That's coaching. And to your point, Wildcard, what you're describing about the coaches and, and the ment mentality, that's just blokes thinking they know better. Like, as we're, we're blokes. We yeah. know this, right? Yep, yep. And, but we also, we also understand that you can't be flapping around with your right wing. You need some left wing coming in to fly straight. You don't want to be flying around in circles. And blokes just seem to think that they know the bit. They know more. Blokes seem to think they know the best things, the best methods, especially when compared to women. Like blokes just say, blokes just think we're fucking geniuses. And if you no, sorry, especially compared to women, because who else are you going to compare us to? Like fucking snakes or rabbits, the, like the monkeys, or <laughs> well, we are monkeys. Um, oh, yes. But in yeah. sport, common ancestry. If, in sport, if you like blokes, <laughs> very few blokes are going to concede they know less than a woman in sport, right? So if you're a bloke, and a lot of this white fern stuff, like whether it's tinkering with the batting lineup or um, selections, squad selections, game day selections, let alone. Like, yeah, you do select Francis Mackay, Kate Ibrahim for a series, let alone, like, where's Holly Huddleston? She just vanished. Like, what was Katie Perkins' incentive to keep playing cricket for the White Ferns? That vanished. Any of those things where it's, like, dubious coaching decisions, well, the blokes know best, right? Blokes know more than the woman. Blokes know what is best for the team more than the woman. And that's a bit of the vibe here as well, is that, well, that's just, yeah, that sums up a lot of those coaching things. I'll take it further, Wildcard. There is only one woman female coach in the domestic cricket landscape off the top of my head. And that's uh, Broadbent, and she's an Aussie. So there is a distinctive bloke flavor to women's cricket in Aotearoa. And the proof is in the pudding. Women's cricket has got worse with more blokes running women's cricket so as blokes we need to get over ourselves and empower women's cricket to be its own thing with its own coaches and yeah some of those domestic coaches i know discredit to them because great things are happening like craig cumming is doing a great job with otago sparks um the dude in charge of the wellington blaze like they have a super smash dynasty good things are happening there because those coaches seem to have the best understanding of women's cricket they seem to have the best connection with their female players like jess and amelia Kerr have developed at an extraordinary rate in that wellington system so that tells me that those coaches know how to work with young women how to work with the top level female athletes as well and understand the woman's game also women's cricket in Aotearoa right now is run by blokes and the proof is in the pudding because the White Ferns underperformed at the World Cup with a very blokey influence and I don't think it's a rocket science to, to connect some dots here and see where the issues are so I'd like to end on that emphatic note if you've got an equally emphatic point share it right now um uh, my emphatic point is maybe just rewind like five minutes and listen to what you just said again <laughs> i don't think i can say anything other than repeating it so people might as well just listen to it and in, in its original state a second time because pretty spot on 